If you would open them to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Starting in verse 14. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if, I'm, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence this morning, O God. We thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to come in here and worship you, to give you glory. There are so many places in the world where this is not possible, but you have blessed us. We live in a land that we can do this. Father, we ask you this morning to open up your word to us, to eliminate your scripture to us, O oh God, that we can look into the perfect law of God, into the perfect word of God, and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Father, I pray this morning that if there are areas in our life that we have wrong thinking, where our thinking does not line up with your word, Father, I pray that you would show that and reveal that to us. That we would come to the place, oh God, where your thoughts are our thoughts. Where your ways are our ways. Where we look at things the way that you look at them, oh God. Where we have the illumination of your spirit to guide us into all truth. And that is our prayer this morning, oh God. Guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, you may be seated this morning. Well, what a message I have for you this morning. Here's how it's going to go. You're really, really going to like this message, or you're really, really, really not going to. And guess which side you ought to be on? Amen. We're going to continue our series this morning on the fundamentals. And when we talk about fundamentals, we use the, the analogy of a football player. If a football player does not have sound fundamentals, they're not going to be a good football player. Same way in Christianity. There are fundamentals that we need to adhere to. There are things that you need to do if you're going to be successful in your walk with the Lord. Just how there is to it. This, Jesus says this is not just something that you look at and you read and you go away. But this is something that you obey and that you do. This Bible is meant to be lived. It is meant to change lives. It is meant to take a, a people that are, that are in darkness and bring them into a light. It is to put the Spirit of God in them and so that the, the, through His Spirit and by His power they can live according to His ways. Praise God. So we're going to look at the fundamentals. We're going to look, this is the third one. And what's our power principle? This is what it is. Same as last week. Be the same next week. This is your power principle. God never tells you or commands you to do something that is not in your best interest. If it's in this word... And God says, this is what you need to do. It's not to harm you. It's not to give you a set of rules. It's because it's in your best interest. It has to because the Bible says what? That God is love. Right? And love does not seek its own. But it seeks the benefit of the other. And if God is love, he seeks your benefit. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, it's not so that you can't have any fun and go around and sleep with whoever you want to. He knows that if you partake of that, it will destroy you. Sin destroys. The wages of sin is death. And if you live a life of sin, you will live a life of destruction. And God says, if he commands us to do something, it's for our benefit. If we could just change the way that we think about that, we think, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this. Oh, what a bummer. This Christian life isn't any good. Oh, no, oh, no. This is the best life. This is the greatest life. You see, God is the manufacturer. He made us. He knows how we work. And if we will, if we will just go by the guidelines of the manufacturer, life works. But if you just disregard the manual, 
and you just do whatever you want, pretty soon you're going to get broken, you're going to run down, and it's not going to be too good for you. So if we look at God's laws and we look at God's Word as a burden, then pretty soon we're going to be weighed down by it. We're going to be lost in legalism. We're going to think that in order to please, please God, I've got to do this and this and this and this, and that's not biblical. God loves you. There's nothing you can do that will cause Him to love you any less. And He can't love you anymore because He, he is love. And we get this idea that we've, we've, we've got to make God happy or if we don't make Him happy, He's not pleased with us. No. When we don't do what He says, He's disappointed for us because He knows this is the way to go and this is the way to life. And when we turn from it, it hurts God. When He sees His children hurting and following a path of destruction, like any parent, it hurts you have children. Some of you have children that have strayed. Some of you have children that are wrong, on the wrong path. You're not mad at them, but you're hurt for them. Because you know where they're headed. The first fundamental was this. little recap. Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. Your life has to be built upon Jesus Christ. Your life needs to rest upon Jesus Christ. He needs to be the absolute cornerstone and foundation of your life. Plain and simple. Without Him, you have nothing. Without Him, you're lost. Without Him, there is not any salvation. He's the key to everything. He's the key to life. He's the key to this world. He's the key to success. He's the key to happiness. He is the key, and without Him, there's nothing but, but, but misery and distress and destruction. Second fundamental is this. Every Christian needs to read this Bible for themselves. Just because somebody stands up here and says, Thus says the Lord, does not necessarily mean that's what God says. He said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. You have to know what this word says for yourself. You have to be able to discern what people are saying. That is a fundamental. You will not be a very strong and, and, and vibrant Christian if you don't know this word. This is your lifeline. If you don't know this word, you are susceptible to being deceived. You are susceptible to being deceived. He said, my word is truth. Do you know the truth? The message today, the third fundamental that I want to talk to you about this morning is the church. Is the church. I want to take this message though in a little different direction than normal. I'm going to fit this message around this statement. And throughout this message, we're going to answer this statement. Are you ready for the statement? I don't have to attend or be part of a church to follow Jesus. That's the statement. Have you heard that before? Have you heard people say that before? I can worship God at home by myself. I don't need to go to church. Have you heard that? Okay. Let's see if that's true. Let's just go into the Word of God this morning and let's see if that bears with truth, with what God says. So before we start, let's do this. Let's define what exactly is the church. And this is no, no, by no means an exhaustive study. You could write a book on what the church is. It's that marvelous. It's that great of an entity. I mean, there's, I mean, the body of Christ, the, the temple of, I mean, there's just so many, the, the bride of Christ. I mean, there's just so many things that you could write about the church. So, so we're not going to be able to cover them all. We're just going to hit one basic idea of the church. So what is the church? The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. And it literally means this. The called out ones. God calls a people out of this world 
to be his very own people. The Bible says actually we don't belong to this world. We belong to another country. This world is not our home. We are called out of this world into the kingdom of his marvelous light. The church is the called out ones. In classical Greek, it became a technical expression for the assembly of people. So by its very definition, church is people assembling together. By its very definition. So, well, I better not get ahead of myself. In the overwhelming majority of New Testament passages, Ecclesia is used as a fixed Christian term as to be translated with a congregation or congregational assembly or church. The word absolutely denotes plurality. More than one. More than one. The church is people coming together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. And there's, there's no debate about that. That's what the word means. The word means to assemble and to come together. The basic aspect of the church is a group of people coming together. The argument is, if I am a part of the church, but I don't congregate with other Christians, how can I be a part of the church? Because the very definition means to congregate. Means to come together. So how can I literally say that I'm a part of the church when I refuse to congregate and be what the church is? People called out to come together to worship and to serve and to come together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what a church is. Am I, do you, are, am I, am I okay so far? Huh? Do you understand what church is? So here's a question. Can I follow Jesus without attending or becoming part of a church. Let's look. Can I give you another word this morning? Heresy. Oh, that's a scary word. Scary word. False doctrine. Or teaching which denies one of the foundational beliefs of the church. I don't have to attend or be part of a church to follow Jesus. Is this statement heresy or not? Is it true? Let's find out. Let's find out. And you know what the reality is? It really doesn't matter what I think. And it really doesn't matter what you think. But what does matter is what God says. That matters. So let's look this morning and see what does God have to say about the subject of church? What's God's take on it? Before I go on, let me give you a definition of church. I gave you one, but it's this. The church is people. The church is not a building. These walls do not constitute, constitute the church. I want you to get your exercise, so would you stand one more time this morning? Go ahead. We're under-exercised in the United States already. This is the church. If this goes out there, the church is no longer here. If we go to the park and have church, that's church. If we go to the restaurant and eat together, guess what? That's church. The church is a group of people coming together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's church. That makes sense. You can go ahead and sit down. I just want you to know that, that you're the church. Jesus didn't die for buildings. He died for people. He died for the church. He didn't die for the church building. Actually, in the New Testament, they didn't really have church buildings. They met wherever they could, most of the time in homes. It's not the building. But sometimes, oh, we sanctify the building. And, and, and there's something to be said about the building, that we come together. This is a place we come together to worship God. So that makes it a holy place. But if we're not here, then it's, it means nothing. We're the ones who make the church the church. It's not the building, it's not the mortar, it's not the wood. It's the people. 
And sometimes we care more about the building than we do about the people. Talk a little bit about relationships. Is that all right? Can I tell you that God is a God of relationships? The first commandment says what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. That's a relationship. It has, he says nothing about the Ten Commandments. He says, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? This, love God. That's about a relationship. God is a relational God. Why did God create you? He created you to have a relationship with Him. That's why you were created. What's the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. Relationship. He's, Jesus said this, if you do these two things, you've done it all. You've fulfilled everything. So if you have the right relationships, you've done it all. If you have a good relationship, the right relationship with the Lord and with other people, you've done it all. God is about relationships. Now, if you're not part of a group of believers, how can you fulfill the second great commandment? To love. If you don't want to be around anybody, you don't want to join together with them, you want to stay off by yourself, how can you fulfill the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. By what? That you love one another. That is the criteria of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is not about obeying a list of rules of do this and don't do that. It is about love. It is about loving one another, loving the unlovable. That, that is what constitutes a true disciple of Jesus Christ. A true disciple of Jesus Christ loves, 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 loves unconditionally. And I want to tell you, if you don't want to be around somebody else, don't tell me how much love you have because you're full of beans. You're full of heart air. It doesn't work that way. I told you, either going to love me or be mad at me after this one. It's all right. The body of Christ. You have your Bibles. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at some things. He calls the church the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Look at 12.12. 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Drop down to verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. How many members are in the body? A lot. Many. That's called unity with diversity. Can I tell you a secret? Not everybody's like you. And that's not a bad thing. Huh? Not everybody has to be like you. It's okay. I know some of you. Bless God, I'm glad there's only one of you. <laughs> we all have different gifts. We're at different places in our life with the Lord. We're not all the same. That's okay. We, can, we should be diverse. There's some things that I can do that you can't do. There's some things you can do that I can't do. And we need everybody to do what God's called them to do, to make up a complete body. That makes sense. Look at verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. It is therefore not, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling? We are not the same. We have different functions. And that's okay. Think about it. If everybody has to be like you, you know what that's called? Pride. P-R-I-D-E. Look at verse 18. But now, 
God has set the members of each one in them in the body just as he pleased. Who puts the members in the body? God. God places you where he wants you to be. The question is, it's not if God wants me to be a part of the body. The question is where? It's not a question of, if, does God want me? And then let me, and I'll, I'll just say this. When I talk about a church, I just want to let it, it, it could be a home church. It doesn't matter. It's not coming to an actual building. It's being, a, it's being part of a group of believers that come together and, and, and do and praise Jesus and come together in his name. And that can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be a church building, but you have to be a part of a group of believers. That's what the Lord is saying. And here's what he's, so he's, the question, God, where do you want me? I mean, so many times we church shop. It's not biblical. Pray. God, what church do you want me to be a part of? Where do you want me to be at? Where are you placing me so that I can, so that I can get into the ministry of that church and be productive and fruitful and fulfill the call that God is on my life? God, where do you want me to be? What group of believers do you want to put me with? And when he does, stay there. Oh, I'm going to preach now. In the first sign of trouble, don't pack your bags and head on down the road. The first time somebody makes you mad, the first time the, the preacher says something you don't like, you're out the door. And guess what? You know what I call it? That's the endless cycle. The endless cycle, a revolving door, church to church to church to church to church. That's not how God intended it. Can I tell you a little secret? The church isn't perfect. The church is not perfect. Why? Because it's, it's full of people. <laughs> that negates it right there. It's full of people with issues. And can I tell you another secret? Not everybody who goes to church loves Jesus. It's the truth. But sometimes people are mean at church. Sometimes people will offend you and, and say hurtful things to you. I know. <laughs> but here's the thing. If the first time trouble comes along and you bolt... You never learn to work through it. You never learn to overcome. You never learn forgiveness. You don't grow because, hey, here's the thing. Can you watch TV and learn about the Bible? Yes. Now, I wouldn't suggest that's all you do because there's some stuff on TV that's really, really questionable when it comes to TV preachers. If that's all you get, hmm. <laughs> I couldn't tell you the last time I heard a TV preacher talk about sin. Just, just saying. You can read books about God and learn a lot. I have. Got a lot more to learn. But here's the thing. You'll never grow without relationships. <laughs> relationships are what cause you to grow. Working through things are what cause you to grow. Hey, when, when everything is, is sailing well and there's no storms, you don't grow through that. You grow through the storms. You grow through God stretching you and molding you and shaping you. You grow, you, you grow by going through the fire. You grow by being pruned. And if every time that God tries to put you through the fire, every time God tries to prune you, all you do is bolt and run away, you're not letting God do what he wants to do in your life. Oh, I ah, Good. Nothing's thrown at me yet. Praise God. And when God puts you somewhere, stay until he moves you. And I'll, get, I'll just go out on a limb here. I'm not going to say John something. If it's when you get mad, that's probably not God. If he moves you, he's probably moving you to a different ministry or a different place. And it's probably not going to be out of anger. Make sense? If it's anger, that you got some issues to work through. All right. Look at verse 20. 
But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the heart, I have no need of you. Look what he says. One member of the body cannot say to another member, I don't need you. But if somebody is staying at home and they're not joining with other believers and they say, I don't need church. Well, that's kind of funny because God says you do. God says you can't say that you don't need anyone else. You can't say that you don't need the church. God, God, God says you need the church. Mm. The problem with this is when we say we don't need each other. And a person who, who, who doesn't think they need to be a part of a church says that they, don't, that, they, that they don't need anyone. You see the problem with this. God says this is, what you, this is what you need. And you say, no, I don't. See, we're getting into a serious issue here. Saying, God, you're wrong. I mean, basically, that's what you're saying. God, you're wrong. God, you might think that I need those people, but God, I don't. Last I checked, God is never wrong. Right? Last I checked, huh? He's perfect, holy. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's what happens with this. This is the danger, and I started thinking about this. This is the danger of this mentality. And it's maybe more dangerous than other things. You know, the Bible talks about a, a sin that does so easily beset you. You know, and sometimes maybe if you're caught in a lie or, or, or you get angry with somebody and, and, and you get hurt feelings and you get offended with somebody you, and you know that you need to repent. You know that the Spirit of God convicts you and you ask God to forgive you and He's faithful and just to forgive you. That's the way that it should work when you sin. But the problem with this mentality is, and here's the huge problem with this mentality is, it justifies sin. It says, God, it's okay if I don't listen to you. God, it's okay if I don't do what you say. You justify your sin. Now here's the thing. When you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. God will work with you and work in you. But when you justify your sin, when you, when you do something that is sin and you say that it's okay, that is a very, very dangerous place to be in. Dangerous place to be in. Think about this. What is faith? What is faith? Believing God. If you want to break it down to its most simple definition, faith is simply believing what God has said. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that, that, that God sent him. I believe that through his sacrifice I am saved. That's faith. Believing what God has said. And the Bible says that you are saved by grace through what? Faith. Believing God. Now here's the problem. Faith is believing what God has said. And when God says you need to be, you need the body. And you say I don't. How can there be faith in that? Because you don't believe God. tough message. I understand. I understand. And finally, here's what happens. This is the most dangerous game to play. You start picking and choosing from the Bible what you want to believe and what you don't. Doesn't work that way. You can't form a God in your image after your likeness. You can't form a God that just does whatever you want him to do. Huh? One man said this. He, he, he was a scholar and a young man was talking to him and he said, uh, no, doesn't it bother you some of the parts of the Bible that you don't understand? He said, no. He said, what bothers me are the parts that I do. that go against my, my flesh, that, that, that tell me to, to, that I need to be crucified, that I need to deny myself. Those are the parts that, that give me a little trouble. <laughs> you can't just pick and choose what you want to believe. What suits you? It's idolatry. 
Plain and simple. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for training, for correction. All scripture. It's not pick and choose which Bible verses you want to believe. You know, you want to believe in the mercy of God and you should because he's merciful. But you also understand that he is holy and he is a God of justice. And there is a judgment coming upon this world. And if your faith is not in Jesus Christ, you are going to experience the judgment of God one day. You might not like that fact. You might not like that truth. But it's a fact. God has said it. Verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Whether you like it or not, we're all in this together. You know the saying, you can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your family. <laughs> We're all in this together. We are one body. We are one body. Obedience. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider and let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. If you don't want to be around other people and in a body of Jesus, who are you considering? Yourself. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Consider one another. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Remember what our power principle is, right? God never tells you or commands you to do something that is not in your best interest. If God says you need to be a part of a body, it's because it's in your best interest. It's what's good for you. You need it. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you love me. This is not a game. Christianity is not a game. God is not someone to be toyed with and, and, and tried to deceive and, and put one over on. He knows your heart. And what this word does, it lays your heart bare. And it judges you. Do you really love God? Because here's the reality. You can put everything else aside if you want. This is the truth. If you love God, you will spend eternity with him. And if you don't, you won't. So that's, 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 that's down to the, to the nub, but that's the truth. If you love God, you'll be with him forever. And if you don't, you won't. And you might be able to fool people around you, but you don't fool him. He knows if you truly, truly, truly love him. Is it all right if I close? You're saying, oh, please. <laughs> if you would, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> sooner the better with this one <laughs> but I'm saying this for the fun because you know, here's, the, here, here's the theme for this year that I want to be a true disciple of Jesus that's my desire and I pray and what I, is that your desire and so what I'm saying there's some things that we need to do we need to make Jesus our cornerstone we need to know his Bible and we need to be in church those are, those are foundations for the Christian faith I pray this morning that I have made my case about being in church through the Word of God. Because here's what happens as a pastor, I see it all the time. Somebody misses a Sunday. Then they start missing more Sundays. Then they start showing up, you know, hit and miss. 
And before you know it, they don't show up at all. And they're no longer walking with the Lord. They're no longer serving Him. His presence, they, never, they no longer have the, 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 the manifestation of His presence in their life. They're lost in their, their, they're in a life of, of bondage and sin. It's inevitable. It's, it's, if, if you start, stop coming to church regularly, it's inevitable that you will fall away from the Lord. It's inevitable. No other way. He said, you need church. I want to give you some practical steps that, that help me. You know, I'm a pastor now, so I have to be in church all the time. I don't have a choice. But I haven't always been a pastor. And these are steps that, that served me well when I wasn't a pastor. Missing church ought to be the exception and not the rule. It happens. I mean, cause, and the, the other thing about this is you don't want to get so dogmatic and so legalistic that, you, you know, bless God, you, you've got to be here all the time. And if you're not, we're going to hit you over the head. You know, you don't want to do that because cause you don't want to be mad at people because they're not at church. But you understand that, that, that you want the best for them and God says the best is for you to be in church. That's going to help you. And you understand that. So, so your heart hurts when they're not. Because you know, as a pastor, I know if they stop coming to church, it's only a matter of time before they, before, before they just drift and, and backslide from the Lord. I know that. It's, it's, it's a 100% accurate rule. I've never seen it not fail. Ever. When I uh, was working, secular job, three rules I made. This, this is me personally. I'm just giving it to you. You know, you have to follow your own conscience. You know, sometimes I would miss church because I had to work. That's understandable, I, I think. Uh, sometimes I miss church because I wasn't in town. But usually if I was somewhere on a Sunday, I'd go to some church. But that's, you know. And sometimes if I was sick, I couldn't be at church. But, I, but this was always our rule. If you, have, if, you know, we, we go to church. It's not an option. That's just how we lived. You know, if I was tired, I still went to church. Because uh, there's times that you're not going to feel like coming to church. There's times I don't feel like coming to church. <laughs> but if all you do in your Christian walk is what you feel like. What a shallow walk that is. He said you walk by faith and not by sight. I understand that even though that I don't feel like, even though that I'm tired, even though I've had a bad week and I'm, and I'm upset and I'm discouraged and I'm depressed, God says that if I'll go to church and I'll gather with other believers, I'll be uplifted and lifted up and encouraged. And if I understand that, that it's for me. That, 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 and who do you think wants to keep you out of church? Do you think that it's God? It's not God, it's the other guy. You know, the littler one that doesn't have the power that the Almighty One has. He doesn't want you in church. Hey, because he knows if he, can, if he can get you out of church, here's what he does. Here's exactly, the Bible says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This is exactly what he does. He looks for somebody who's weak. And he tries to isolate them and set them off so that he can destroy them. Because he knows this, if they're in the herd, he can't touch them. Huh? Because the strong ones will beat him to a pulp. Basically. Last I checked... We have authority over the old boy. Huh? I've given you all authority over the power of the enemy. <laughs> Sometimes coming to church will require a sacrifice. But can I tell you, you've been called to a life of sacrifice. <laughs> if you don't think Christianity is about sacrifice, I don't know which Christianity you're in. Because this one says present your, your body as a living sacrifice. This one says deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Christianity is a life of sacrifice. And sometimes coming to church is a sacrifice. But here's what I know about God. The sacrifice never outweighs the blessing. I'll give you an example. In the Old Testament, God would require a bull. They'd give him a bull... 
And he would, he would atone their sins for a year. What a deal. I give you a cow and, and you forget about my sins for a year. Huh? What a deal. Uh, the tithe. He said, if you'll give me 10%, the first 10, what will I do? I'll open, up a, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing which you cannot contain. So you give God 10 and he opens up the windows of heaven. Wow. Huh? Uh, Jesus said, if you sacrifice your life, if you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. So you live for Jesus, what, 50, 60 years? And he, and he grants you eternal life. Wow. See, the blessings from God are always greater than the sacrifice you give to God. So if you'll sacrifice it and be a part of a church even when you don't feel like it, the blessings from it, the blessings from it. I don't know about you, but, but I, I, I believe God is in this place this morning. And I feel I'm going to be good when I go home. Huh? There's another reason you need to come to church. Your kids. You need to bring your kids to church. They need to know who Jesus is. Hear me. Our brother told us this morning, they can't get into the schools anymore. They can't put Bibles in the school. Sister so Kathy will tell you what they're teaching in the school. And it does not line up with this. Your children are bombarded five days a week with everything, with stuff that is anti-God. That, 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 that undermines the teachings of Scripture. Every day they hear this. Every day they're taught this. You need them to be in church so they can hear the Word of God. So that they can be taught the Word of God. They are at an age that they're impressionable and you can teach them. Do it for your children. Come to church when you don't feel good. Here's the rule that I use too. If I'm good enough to go to work, I'm good enough to go to church. <laughs> if I can go to work with a sinus headache, I can go to church with a sinus headache. Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you about that, okay? James 5, 14 through 16 says this. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Well, now if God's word tells me, if I'll come to church and the leaders of that church will put oil on me and pray for me, God will heal me. Well, isn't that what it says? Huh? Here's the thing. Do you really believe that what you really believe is real? Think about this. If you really believe that if I'll come to church and, 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 and they'll pray for me and anoint me and God will heal me, why wouldn't you come to church? There's only one reason. You don't believe it. You might say you do, but, but you really don't believe it or you'd be there, right? I mean, it's a, it's a matter of faith. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe there's a blessing when you come to church? Even when you don't feel like it? I'll close with this. Don't make coming to church an option. That's really the key. Don't make it an option. If you want to be a fundamental Christian who is serving the Lord and walking with Him, you need church. That's what he says. Don't make it an option. Well, I just don't feel like it today. Don't make it an option. Lord, this is something that I'm going to do because you've told me to do it. You've told me to be part of a church. Like I said, you need to be careful because you don't want to be legalistic about it. But you understand if God tells you to do something, it's for you. It's to help you. You can't be. You cannot follow Jesus by yourself. That's what this word says. You have to belong to a group of believers. Plain and simple. Amen. I know I was rough on you today. I'm sorry.
Praise the Lord. Would you please stand this morning? And I know that we're bombarded in a society that is absolutely anti-God. The attacks of the enemy out there are so strong against Christians. We get beat up sometimes. We get beat up badly sometimes. And we're wounded. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we come to church wounded, we get wounded even further. I hope this is not that kind of church. I hope this is a church that when people come in wounded and hurt, that they can be uplifted and encouraged and strengthened and loved unconditionally. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would show us the necessity of being part of a church. That we can love one another just as you have loved us. That we can lay down our life for our friends just as you laid down your life for us. Oh God, help us next time we get weary and tired and weak and we don't want to be in church. Give us strength, oh God. That we can be a blessing to one another and that we can come to church and be blessed by one another, oh God. Father, mold us and shape us together in one accord. That we might lift up your name. Father, our desire for 2012 is to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. May this be. May this be our greatest year ever. May this be the, the church, the church that you died for. May it be its greatest year ever. Father, you said that you're going to pour out your spirit in the last days. There are 2.8 billion people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you've called your church to do it. But we can only do it together. Working together for your glory. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessings this morning. Lord, I pray your grace and your mercy upon your people. In Jesus' name. Amen.